when it's like ingrained in them that they need to get to the states from yeah. the get go. It's like that's that's our mission, you know. We need to get up there. That that seems to be it. So when they start seeing people starting to come to their own town, they start to like check themselves a bit and be like, "What? Like, okay, what? What's so attractive about my town?" And then it's like, "Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, this town is good." And you start to see yeah, like a change, pride. yeah, yeah. Uh, which is great. It's great. It's like an appreciation for their own place. We've got uh, Andy, our uh, audio and visual maestro here, all, all riled up. He uh, first time ever he made a, a mistake on our first run, so we're we're gonna roll this back. But uh, we're we're having fun with it here. So uh, Andy, you are the best. So Thank you. Good. yes, yeah. yes, that's that's a pretty it's good, good ratio. Uh, yes, <laughs> that's a good ratio. If if you were a trader, you'd be you know at the top of the thing. food chain. <laughs> Uh, all right, let's do this again. So I, I, it won't be as funny the second time around, but I was, you know, talking about was, how uh, you. I want to hear you speak Spanish with with an Irish accent because uh, that's got to just kind of like throw people. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you want me to, yeah. Si quieres que hable un poco de español, lo puedo puedo hablar con quiera. See, that's, that's not an Irish accent. That sounds Spanish. So you, you gotta. I, I think I you're gonna. Just yeah, myself. I think you're gonna have to, you know, play up your Irish accent a little bit. Uh, Como so estás, gonna... señor? <laughs> uh, so Irish who grew up in Spain. Yeah. And now you're in El Salvador. Let's uh, let's let's dive into a little bit of the the history there. So you, you're born in Ireland. Born, yeah, born okay. in Ireland. So born in Ireland, Galway, the west. So a lot of rain, a lot of grey, but a beautiful, uh, beautiful land, cliffs. Born there, and at the age of four, then I moved with my mother and my older sister to to the south of Spain. My mum was a, an English teacher, and she she could set up there. So. Spain was Spain was fantastic. Did uh, primary school there. Went to a Spanish public school and uh, got really into soccer. And that was my that was my thing. So there is a bunch of students then in Spain that speak English with an Irish accent than the ones that your mother was teaching. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> international is like these international kids that come in. Yeah, it's a lot of English. My uh, so so my kids, you know, obviously they grew up here, and we the till junior high we we homeschooled, and we would bring in tutors. A lot of times there was you know people living here for a couple of years, and so they had one of their tutors was Irish, one was French Canadian, and uh, another one was from Australia. So depending on which teacher they had on time, they would have the weirdest accents. They'd be talking to us, and my I remember my son, he's like. Dad, I'm doing a report on the Colosseum. I'm like, what? The Colosseum? What's the Colosseum? You know, the Colosseum where they like fight the gladiators and all that. I'm like, you mean the Colosseum, John? He's like, no, Dad, it's called the Colosseum. And I'm like, no, that's because you have a French Canadian tutor that's uh, teaching you and uh, in her second language. And so it's it, it's funny watching them. They grew up with this mix of, you know, Irish and Australian and, and French Canadian English. So. That's mad, like pure sponges. Yeah. Kids, yeah. I don't know what my accent was like back, back then, but uh, you know, it definitely developed over time. The Spanish accent developed over time. No, you you speak like you know somebody from Spain. I mean, if I just heard your voice, I'd be like, yeah, that's Spanish. So you've got that. What um, was it hard for you to learn the language when you when you moved there? I I well, I was only four years old. I all I know from from what I've been told is that I didn't speak Spanish. And then after about a year and a half, then one day I just started blabbing out Spanish. Just it just started coming out. But uh, but like you can't you can't avoid being where you're from as well and people like that's 
that you're, you're going to be treated yeah. like so or whatever. But uh, yeah, you eventually just get get into the flow of uh, of of being of being there. And uh, the more you see, the public school that I went to, I was in a kind of more international school, and then I went to public school. So there was no option for you to not speak Spanish. So you started out the international school, and then you went to the public school. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I thought that was good. It's good. And did you feel like you fit in there or were you always kind of like a little bit different or was it? Well, I was different for the start and I didn't feel like I fit it in. But then, as I, I said back in the last podcast, uh, that once you get into sports and once I got into soccer, then everything kind of starts falling into place. Got really into soccer and played well for a team, was the captain. And that that allowed you to fit in as, as much as you want. Yeah. So, and then you jumped back to Ireland and you were telling me, you know, usually you hear stories of gambling, losing, you know, leading to things in a family falling apart, but that was uh, yeah. uh, your ticket to, to boarding school. Was it boarding school? Boarding school. Yeah. yeah. So I was in Spain and I was with my mother, my older sister, and the father started getting into, into poker quite a bit. He was always into poker, but he started playing a bit more professionally and he was in Barcelona and ended up on the final table playing the European Poker Tour and came second after structuring a deal and ended up winning a million and had the opportunity to send me to a school in Ireland. So they decided on a, a boarding school in the middle of the countryside. So I was in what, what grade level was that? That was well. Uh, Grade, I'd say grade eight. Okay. Yeah, American. That's yeah. So I was. I don't 11. know what the divisions are in Europe. If there's so a... primary school, secondary school, primary school first at sixth, and then secondary school is first to to sixth year. Okay. Yeah, essentially. So you go into secondary school when you're around twelve, and that's when I moved over. So it's just at the start of my adolescence, and. Oh, perfect time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just <laughs> just when you want to be moving, sh changing. <laughs> changing shift but it was good yeah eventually going over to ireland uh it was a big change for me for sure so so then you you looked like the students there but you probably sounded different and the way i socialized yeah, culturally was yeah. very different yeah 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 which sometimes is, is more challenging i see that with my kids they grew up here and sometimes when they go back to the the u.s like you know, just their mannerisms the way they do things it's they're like, oh, I guess they don't do that here. And so. Wow. No, exactly. Like, I think Irish are more humble than the Spanish, less, less, less vain uh, without generalizing too much. But so that kind of worked <laughs> against me because I was like <laughs> a like big this, speaker. Yeah, and like a, got a big ego. He, and, exactly, exactly. And when you're going into first year and the other years start to see that doesn't go down well. But uh, so it was a tough start, but then things kind of iron themselves out. <laughs> my my uh, daughter was telling me she just started university in the U.S. and and you no. know and she's she's trying to learn all those things, navigate those things. And she said that uh, you know there was guys talking to her that you know she just thought they were just being friendly. And you know here guys are very outgoing, and you know if they're like trying, trying to yeah. hit on you. And she thought that, you know, they were just being friendly and she's like, and then I, you know, was just in conversation, brought up my boyfriend, not specifically, but just was talking and the guy's like, oh. <laughs> and her roommate's like, didn't you know that he like, you know, he liked trend. you? And then she's like, no, that's just way different. And El Salvador, like if they're they, trying they, to hit on you, you know, they're trying to hit on you. So. <laughs> on top of you. So she was wow. like trying to, she's like, I got to adjust now. Now I have to have like, I have to have my friends like clue me in on, on those type of, you know, social cues that are just different in every, every culture. That's mad. So. Where, where, where is she? She's at Westmont. It's okay. uh, like a small uh, Christian liberal arts college in Santa Barbara. It's wow. actually, my wife and I both went there. No uh, way. Yeah. We met both? there. Yeah. We met there our freshman year. That's cute. Um, Ironically, we were we were like best friends for three years. We were both dating other people. And then finally, our senior year really spurred by a Europe semester program that our school did where you you went with like a small contingent of 30 students and traveled all throughout Europe studying art and history. Wow. And so we did that whole thing together. Were you in the same class? 
so in that there was only one yeah we were same grade okay and in there there was only you were one group it was two it was mostly people in their their third or fourth year of, of university they were on this class and so we were there together and we were already like best friends and that was back in the days of uh before like cell phone cameras and the, you know you still actually brought a camera and I was the only one on the the trip that didn't bring a camera. So I was like, well, I'll just be in all the pictures with you. So so now we have all these great pictures of us uh, all throughout just Europe. Before yeah, you and we weren't even dating. So, hit it off. Uh, that's, yeah. that's amazing. So you decided, did you decide to to send your daughter to, or did she? Come? No, we, we tried to like, my daughter's the type that if you like push her into something, she'll go a different direction. She's kind of like me. So, you know, we, we, took her to visit. She did. They had like a summer one week program there. And but we, we told her like, hey, you kind of look at all these different choices, decide where you want to go. She did really well in school. She was, she was one of the top students in her class and um, she had a lot of options. But we wanted her to go to a smaller school just because of the cultural things and uh, be a place where, you know, you go to some of the big universities in the US, you get like run over. We wanted a place that be a little easier for to make the cultural adjustments mm. because you know, you have all the normal adjustments of like leaving your family, starting university, but then you have all these cultural adjustments on top of it. And it's also a bit more independent of feel. Would it, yeah. would it be? Yeah. More independent. Independent of uh, having to abide by certain standards, let's just say that large, large yeah. universities might have to go under. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I think it's, um, especially at this school, it's, uh, they really push students to think and you know challenge there and they they haven't bought into the whole woke movement that is taken over most universities and so but they're they're also not on the other side like they they really challenge students to dig into things so so we're excited it's uh, i actually just saw her last week when i went to pacific bitcoin conference it's just a couple hours up from there so went up and spent a couple couple i think like Three or four days with her. So, oh, wow. So yeah, so that was a lot of fun. So. It's, uh, and, you know, kids always like appreciate their family more once they leave. And so she's like, I miss you guys so much. We're like, yeah, I told you, I told you. You didn't realize <laughs> how good we were. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. So, but it was, uh, nah, it was, it was a lot of fun. I, I can't remember what we were talking about. I guess yeah. they're talking about my kids. Yeah. Oh, school. So, school. so you were, so you were in Ireland. In and, Ireland. Yeah. And then I got into, well, and, and this was, I'm assuming like, very driven students all your classmates these are the people that are well no go they were just to... wealthy they were just rich they're like politicians kids there's mexican kids like I, I met one guy who was the like a godson of carlos slim i don't know if oh, you know yeah. carlos slim from like mexico I, mean, I don't know him personally but i know who he is yeah <laughs> so you had all all the all these all these types but obviously the uh, academic rugby was huge as well so like that a lot of priority that was a high priority but i I was always driven, even in primary school, like competitively, I'm very competitive. So even my my grades, I was always like trying to get the top grades. So I kept that up um, and I really got into maths and uh, science. And then I just kind of honed down for for then, it's like high school. So the, the end of secondary school for Ireland, uh, the, the final exam in Ireland is like, it's like super important because They've really emphasized in Ireland education and make sure your child gets into university. So the exam called the leave insert is very important. So that's like every like everyone does like it's huge amount of grinds for it. And um, it ended up working out really well. I was getting into soccer and I was trying to get a scholarship for soccer in America. But then I got decent grades to go into this course, which was actuary, like financial maths. And I ended up going for that. So in, in Ireland's the the other country in the world that calls soccer by its correct name. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna get shot here in El Salvador for saying that. But uh, yeah, yeah. I was, it was funny. You usually always hear people call it football. You're like, no, it's soccer in in Ireland. Soccer, yeah, because the Gaelic football. So there's another really important sport in Ireland. There's Gaelic football and then there's hurling. So hurling is the sport where you have a large wooden stick and you you you. You play around with a, a ball called a slither. And, really? Oh yeah, and a helmet, and it's supposedly the fastest field sport that exists on the planet. It's highly, highly. So is it like lacrosse, or is it's it... much more aggressive? Okay. And it's like there's fifteen 
players on each team and there's goals and like they carry people off in stretchers at the end yeah yeah and you can yeah you know if you get if you're mad with someone else you can hit them with the stick like you know <laughs> no it's so that's a huge part of the irish culture it's the ga which i never really got into um because i i grew up in spain but you have to really appreciate it for for the way it brings the communities together and um yeah so it's soccer in in ireland not, not football and and then did you go to university in ireland or yeah so i had the decision whether to do to i got a few offers for a scholarship in the states or do that course so i, I ended up going to college in dublin and ended up with a small class of about 50 um actuaries or actuarial students and that's where i met some some like some of my best friends that i still like i was hanging out with one of the guys literally couple, last week he came up to berlin and he's come to move to el salvador as well one of my classmates really yeah and i've got another classmate coming down from new york he's leaving his job in deloitte to check out el salvador and yeah so some of my best friends i met in that class and it was it was amazing the it's, university it's experience. fascinating the the number of really dynamic people from around the world that are flowing into el salvador right now i mean it's if you would have predicted that five years ago, people would have said you were insane, but it's, yeah. Are you seeing it? Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, this is just this conversation here. This is one of many I hear of people. Yeah. I came here. This was my background. These other people are flowing in. Um, a lot of them with no firm plans, but just the sense of there's more opportunity here in El Salvador and they want to be part of what's happening here. And the type of people that, you know, just have a history of making things work. So they'll mm. land on their feet and figure it out as they go. But they're just excited to be here and be a part of it. Yeah. And it's also the network effect as well. Though. Like more people that are here from a certain area, the more other people are attracted as well, I feel, over the course of time. I, I, I find it amazing. That's one of the main reasons I came over here is like-minded people and the diverse sets of mindsets let's say um but we can touch on that a bit yeah, after, yeah. Um, so so it wasn't a direct flow from so you were in school and then you went and did the yeah. traditional yeah finance well, thing, finance thing went think, to I university think we have some pictures of you in your suit and all all dressed up yeah so uh i was getting into investing in like third year i was like i want to be a multi-millionaire i want to know how to maintain wealth and i was looking into uh into there investing yeah so this is the rotman international trading competition it's a simulation of like 52 universities in toronto wait which which one are you the one on the right yeah it's oh right. really yeah yeah <laughs> young fella um so so that was yeah that was interesting that was a, a time where you learned a lot about the financial world the type of students that will be overtaking the financial uh jobs and uh, it was the start of me getting like yeah into into that finance space quite a lot like the the investment side of things and it was entertaining so that that was the trading competition graduated and i did i did an internship in pricewaterhouse coopers which in is in ireland in ireland in okay. dublin as well that's a big four accountancy firm yeah and it was in, it was with a team of highly like high performers let's just say and that was really interesting good experience i think there's another picture that shows well that was me graduating um with the class a lot of good friends there and uh, they 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 pump you up a lot because ireland's taking in all these insurance companies because of its corporate tax rate so oh, anyone yes. in the university their apps they're like they they put you on the pedestal they're saying you're brilliant um I, the, on the far left the one with the the gold suit yeah i was trying to be a bit so, different <laughs> <laughs> What what year did you uh what year did you graduate? 20 uh, 2018 2018 2018. Yeah. So when you went back to Ireland, I'm, I'm trying to I'm, I'm old so my years all blend together, but that was I know when I was young, Ireland was viewed as kind of like a poor backwater. Totally. And then it became this, you know, behemoth with I think the tax law changes and and everything. And so was that kind of were you going to school while Ireland was like still in that like rising stage? So, uh, story of Ireland, uh, 80s 
total like poverty everyone was moving to London uh, and then late 90s then money started flowing in and you had the Celtic Tiger I don't know yes, if you've that's, heard yeah, yeah. the Celtic that's Tiger right yes the yeah, Celtic Tiger which was like from 2000 up obviously to the great financial recession and that was a huge amount of influx of money you had like brickies guys who lay bricks who'd be making like two to three euro per brick like it was like there was helicopters going to races it was like ice sculptures in every party that it was just extravagance and then all of a sudden 07 08 uh, that the financial recession really affected ireland okay and there was massive austerity but ironically my father won the turn came second in the tournament in 08 so then i went to board okay so you were going there right when they were the recession okay. so i was going to a boarding school when recession hit and i was coming out of school when it was coming out of recession and that's when all the multinational corporations started flowing into dublin uh and insurance companies so you have loads of reinsurance companies insurance companies you have you know the the usual like Citibank, uh, jp morgan and uh, morgan stanley and you've got a lot of people trying to study finance and getting into these type of jobs so that was like that was the that was the movement so that's that's Price Waterhouse there to the left, and I, I was on the fourth floor looking onto the river and worked there for a couple of years, uh, auditing like large insurance companies as an actuary. And I, I got exposed to like a lot of big balance sheets. And I was testing their balance sheets for risk and checking their assumptions to see if they were in line with regulation. And then I started realizing, what the fuck is all this regulation? And then I started looking deep into their balance sheets, like really deep. And I was studying Bitcoin at the same time and long term investing, and I was trying to figure out why they were all invested in so many bonds that were zero uh, percent coupons. It just didn't make yeah. any logical sense to me. And then I started realizing the central banks uh, like regulation where they'd allow you to hold less reserves based on the type of assets that you held in, under your balance sheet. And then things started getting really weird. I start, I, I mentioned Bitcoin to the partners. Um, I had like talks with the teams about Bitcoin and they were like learning from me what Bitcoin was, but they were receptive, but it was, it was, they were never incentivized. Really. What, what year was this? This was, uh, 19, 18, 19. Okay. Yeah. So I, I was talking to the manager and I ended up like, we were all sitting around for I think it was my going away because I was going off to, to Australia, I decided. And the manager was like to the partner, she was like, oh, we need to buy a Bitcoin for the team and we need to like, like review, uh, you know, the price or whatever. They, they never, obviously never bought it, but <laughs> they, they heard a lot about it when I was there. So that was that was in PwC. A lot of people in uh, Ireland after university, even if you study something like ag science, like agricultural science, you end up working for an accountancy firm. They just eat up all the use there and they pay them like a low wage and get like this cheap labor. Yeah. So I was like, I don't want to keep going. And that's when I decided to head off to Australia. And you just, you wanted to spend some time traveling or you kind of were, nah, this isn't the industry for me or a combination of both? So I actually really enjoyed the job. I really thought it was great. I liked analyzing. I loved Excel. I know that sounds weird, but I was a pure geek <laughs> and uh, I enjoyed it. But I was in my 20s and I felt like, oh, oh, OK, there's actuarial exams. And I was like, no, these actuarial exams aren't. I have to do five more years of these exams. And I, the people above me didn't inspire me too much, the managers. And I was like, I don't want to end up like that. So I had this opportunity with a couple of friends a couple of Irish friends to come over to Australia and they just we said we I was entrepreneurial it was like let's yeah. try and set something up there and we listen to a lot of music we go to a lot of uh, raves and a lot of uh, you know music scenes so we're like let's try and set something up so we arrived into Melbourne in the early 2020 and and that's that's seems like it's pretty common for Irish in their teens or early 20s to go travel and and but to do to work along the way um you know mm. often not in a legal fashion but the to you know just find things to to do like i, I we'd see that in the u.s at a food service business and every summer there would be you know the j1 uh, yes. well and some of them that didn't quite have that and their friends had them they decided to come along and they'd find people that pay them cash and it was 
but it, it just seemed like it was part of like culture. Yeah. Like, yeah, if you go after whether it's high school or university and you go travel and you, you know, you don't, it it's out. not like you have to save up a bunch before you just figure it out along the way. Well, I, I actually really liked it. They always seem like they have the best attitude. They're willing to do anything and they're just like <laughs> having fun. Sometimes yeah. partied a little too hard, but oh, uh, I'd say, yeah. I'd, no, I'd say, I'd say so. The Irish, I think it might have to go back to the famine. Like the, this idea of mig migrating, like a lot of y young go off to other places. Like right now, there's a huge amount of youth that have gone off to Australia. Oh, really? Off, oh, like huge amount. Like a lot of the people there now are just uh, people coming from other countries. A lot of the youth la leave the country. They don't, they don't like it there. Um, you're, you're talking about they leave Ireland. Yeah, they leave okay. Ireland. They go to Aust Australia now, a huge pop hugely popular place. Canada, obviously, as well. But um, so we went over kind of doing the usual Irish thing, but it ended up being a completely different experience. Arrived 2020, January, uh, yeah, and March comes and it's COVID has happened. So we were working in construction and doing something completely different to like working in the office. And then they announced that there's this uh, pandemic and we're in the middle of a city. <laughs> We need to get the fuck out of here. We need to get out of here. Like we really do. Um, uh, the the prime minister was saying everyone who was here needs to get out of the country. We're not going to protect you. Or we're not going to provide for you, blah, blah, blah. He said, no, we'll stick it out. Like we've come over. We might as well keep going. We bought a few cars and then we went up to Queensland. And that's where um, that's where we started picking bananas, <laughs> uh, humping bananas, they say. So there's these 70 kg, but like we... We were just on the road and we were like, we need to find a job and we need to go to a farm. And we found uh, the, this hostel called Banana Barracks and we all ended up in banana farms for six months. <laughs> so is the hostel just for people that are working in the yeah, banana farms? Yeah, it's a working farms? hostel. And they're all like in their 20s, international. And it was in the middle of COVID. So everything was locked down. We were all, all these young 20 year olds in a hostel. Like what, what's going to happen? Like, you know. It was mad. It was absolutely mad, but it was it was great fun. It was like you have to be really fit to be out there because you're eight hours just like loading 70 kg. So you got physically really fit. You met all these people like from Fijians that didn't have any English. They had like your, your man Mo had about four kids and he was married and he was hanging around with these young fellas. So different coming from different backgrounds, uh, but we all got on. So that was Queensland. Uh, we kept traveling then up to Darwin. This is on the road trip and ended up in Western Australia. And in Western Australia, I kept the, the music up and, you know, I was actually working in the mines for three months. We're looking for gold. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I was out in the desert looking, looking for silver and gold. So, so what, what did that involve? Like, was well, it, I mean, were you swinging a pickaxe and I mean, that headbutting the rocks? No. Um, no, because they're massive drills. So they have like these trucks and then they have these kind of diamond encrusted drill drill bits and they go down like a kilometer down underneath and they're looking for samples. You get the sample. The geologist has a look, sees if it's something that would be close to a gold mine. But we'd have to go out to the desert. We'd have to set up camp and we'd be out there for like two weeks straight without going to a shop and it'd just be like four smelly lads to, to, <laughs> together out there. And um, yeah, there was some gold that was found. Uh, it was it was an experience. It was three months of like highly intense. I'd be out there for maybe a month working every single day for 12 hours. And I felt like that was beneficial for my tough toughness or whatever. Yeah. But then end of 2021, the mandate started getting a bit heavy in Australia in terms of the 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 jab and it was um i was just i felt like everything was getting a bit eerie over there so i said okay it's time to see the family and i decided to return to europe but i i stopped in india for three months and i did a yoga teacher training and a good bit of meditation and yoga and then uh then i went back to europe and so did that did that seem you said it got started to get eerie in Australia. For me, I've never been to Australia. I've, I've, I've traveled quite a few places, but but never there. But I always envisioned these as like hardy people that, and the way they reacted to COVID 
really blew me away. I was really kind of shocked at yeah. So was that surprising to you or was it like, no, this makes sense that um so they're hardy people, especially on the mines, they're very hardy. I I was like I always put Australia and Canada nearly in the same bucket, which okay, people are gonna like kill me, but I feel like from like obviously United Kingdom uh has a big influence on both of them. And I feel like their currencies and their financial systems are also internationally quite big. So I feel like there's a, a huge top down uh, efforts going from both of Australia and Canada. So I was aware of that. And like all this, yeah, like the mining operations are, they're huge scale. So, and the governments are intrin intrinsically linked with these ma ma big companies. So I wasn't too surprised when I started seeing all these mandates, like should have seen the, the hostel got caught because one backpacker had been in a warehouse and then like there was a SWAT team coming in basically. The guys with the half hazard suits, you had like four news channels outside a helicopter. It was, it was mad, like people escaping, trying to like, like actually getting, getting followed into a forest and, and getting brought in because they they did they weren't in the hostel and they'd been there that morning like just mad stuff was happening so that's when um i was like i don't want to be a part of this i want to be in a different jurisdiction and then went back to europe and that's when i went to spain to see my mother she was in spain and worked in a bitcoin shop there your mom worked in a Bitcoin shop. I no, sorry, oh. my mom was a, still a teacher, okay. and then I okay. ended up going back, and I found a Bitcoin store, and I went in, and I asked for a job, and they were like, "Yeah, no bother." And what do you mean by a Bitcoin store? Like, what's so in Spain? There's like these physical Bitcoin stores that are dotted across the country. The main one is Bitbase, and it's one of the largest like Bitcoin crypto companies that exist in in Europe, and they have these physical spots where you just go in. And if you want to sell your Bitcoin, you get cash. And if you want to do the other way, you also do it. And they just take a massive spread and people avail of those services. So you physically go in to the, to the store. Yeah, it's a, it's a quite a like nice looking store. We have massive screen that has the Bitcoin. I guess like price. an easy user experience for people that are intimidated by using the exchanges or doing, they just want to have somebody in front of them. Okay. Exactly. And what are the spreads like? 8%, 8%, eight, well, 10% below a thousand, 8% over a thousand. And uh, yeah, there's the Bitcoin machine and then there's the person and he, that person gives you the cash. So I saw these spreads and I saw the revenue that was going through and I was like, Jamie Mackers. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what, why? And then I realized, well, there was all the Russians that were coming over because of the war. You know, they just wanted to live in the sun and they, they just changed their rubles into Bitcoin. They were all cut off from any banking situation. So they couldn't access any cash with their card. If you had a Russian passport, you couldn't open up a bank account. Uh, still, still is like that. So they'd buy uh, Bitcoin or USDT in, in Russia and then they just cash out in, uh, in Spain. And the same applies for the Argentinians. Loads of them were coming over because of inflation that was mm -hmm. happening, crime. And if they wanted to buy a house, they just sell their USDT and we'd give them the cash or we could do them a transfer directly to their account. So, so yeah. And then I have, just, have, uh, have you heard of Bitcoin Akasi that's in uh, South Africa? So Erman, who runs that, he, he actually has a surf tour company also that his, his wife is Russian. So they've always specialized in Russian surfers, which is a real niche. Um, but yeah, he said that they've always been Bitcoin focused, but now he says for sure it's Bitcoin only. Like there's no, they don't have access to anything else. And so a lot of these people have never used Bitcoin before, but that's what they tell me. You have this, is what you have to do and you have to, you know, but I think recently they shut down Binance there, which was used in, in, in Russia, in which Russia. was used for a lot of the peer to peer. I think Binance had a peer to peer Correct. platform yeah. that was was heavily used there but he said it's it's tough these people you know they have nothing to do with the war you know most of them don't like putin but they're being punished now and that's the way that they can still transact and because of that they can they can still come to south africa and do their you know vacations and that sort of thing so oh, it's, like the it's, use case is is huge the use case and to see that firsthand is, is mad 
I think Russia have like a, a law in that you cannot transfer it from one. They don't want you to use it as money, but they don't mind you holding it for longer than a year uh, and saving it. Yeah, I think that's that's so it's tough. It's tough. Ukrainians as well, obviously. Well, that's what he said. The The first I think he said their first customer they had that did it was from Ukraine because they're getting hit by the same sanctions that the Russians are a lot of times. Like for some reason they're lumped together. And so yeah. they, uh, yeah, he said, he said most of their clients are either Russian or Ukrainian and they, but they both use Bitcoin. Like that's. And is he able to use Bitcoin then around that area? In yeah. So, so, you know, he's, it's can be a little challenges at times, but he's found ways to you know, basically live on a on a Bitcoin standard. And there there are some exchanges there that I think you know occasionally he'll exchange. But um, we spent some time with him, and it seems like he's found ways to do do most things wow. in in Bitcoin, which is uh, no, which is pretty great. But on the the other side, you're saying the Argentinians. It's funny because we we were in uh, Mexico uh, I don't know six months ago for. It was it was a definitely a, a shitcoin conference once we got there, but they they'd asked us to speak, and there was a project in Yucatan that that we wanted to see. So we're like, all right, we'll 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 go. And uh, the conference was I won't get into that, but uh, um, we we met uh, we were in one of the cenotes, like the swimming holes they have there, and we were talking to this Argentinian couple and talking about bitcoin he was an accountant and he was like very like negative like no it's a scam and the volatility and you know going on and on and then like in the next breath his wife was complaining about how their credit cards don't work and that it's so hard for them to travel and access money <laughs> we just looked at each other like there's no point do you do you hear what you're saying here like bitcoin fixes this and but what was their response? They were like, uh, you know, it's, I, I don't know, for some reason, it's like they have blind, people have blinders on. Well, they especially just, if you're an accountant, like you're so close to the, uh, that side of things. Yeah. yeah, you're like, you're in the middle of it. And But know. when you're there complaining that your banking system doesn't work and your cards don't work, it, it seems like, you know, sometimes it takes people a little bit longer to, to wake up to what's happening. Yeah, yeah, that's one thing that's been, very eye open as well. Like who who wakes up first? I, maybe that sounds a bit arrogant, but like uh, no, no, I know I know exactly what you're saying. Like yeah, it's, but it's yeah, very interesting to see like what personality types and what backgrounds. And a lot of times it's not like based on pure intelligence or anything like that, but it's or the classic way of how you measure yeah. intelligence. It's it's a different, but usually you can tell when you meet somebody, even if they're not a Bitcoiner yet, you can tell if they're going to become one. Like you, you're like you're a Bitcoiner, you just don't know it yet. So true. So so you're working at the Bitcoin store. So working at the Bitcoin store, see the revenue, and then decide right. Well, let's go and do this myself. And went halves with uh, the owl lad with my father on a Bitcoin machine, and we got it imported from North Portugal into Spain. I had to go find a place to put it into. So I found this uh, exchange shop where they'd exchange cash. And I, I talked to David and I was like, listen, like, why don't why don't you sell Bitcoin as well here? It's like it's synergistic, you know, like synergy. Uh, and he was all over it. He talked to his accountant. It was all OK. And we put it in there. And yeah, so ended up at the same time when I'd made that decision, I got an offer for a uh, back with a financial company in, in Ireland, Standard Life, an insurance company that like managed Phoenix Group, which is their parent company managed, like they're the second biggest insurance company in Europe, like something crazy, huge amount of billions. So I went back there and that's where I worked as a calculations analyst for about eight months. And that was interesting. Uh, I had to talk with a lot of the, the guys at the top there and you talk about Bitcoin and I remember speaking to the head actuary and I was talking to Bitcoin and I was saying, listen, like, why don't we try and implement Bitcoin as part of the portfolio for these pensioners? Because I was reviewing their pensions and they were losing 11% on their, on their lowest risk, port, on their lo lowest risk uh, portfolio. Like 
they were this year and i was writing up the report the market report for because they were so exposed to bonds exactly yeah, yeah it was like you know 60 70 percent bonds yeah <laughs> and i was like well like your job as an insurance company is to maintain the wealth of your policyholders like that's that's the purpose of standard life and you've been able to do it for 150 years like are you going to let are you going to let this go like this purpose that you've held for so long and you know you get this so oh, they're just going to laugh you out the room with this clown money and uh, i was like you know fair enough like oh, i'm still i'm happy to sit in the room with them like and for them to laugh but like this is a serious like the, uh, i was reviewing their 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 portfolio and like the largest asset that they're holding is a zero percent Bundesbank bond and I'm supposed to reply to their complaints about how poorly performing their portfolio is through an email. And I'm like, I'm such a divide. Like, uh, I just don't know. I'm just like, read the market report. You see what's happening world and worldwide and why your bonds are working like that. So when I left, I actually wrote at the very bottom of like the market report in between like the all rights reserved study Bitcoin, like trying to get, <laughs> <laughs> trying to get these guys to... Yeah. Uh, open up so yeah so I was in I moved to London then and I was looking for like a hedge fund job I was trying to climb so, so just real quick Sorry, so yeah. do you still have is this I had the, I is had this that, ATM still I had functioning it in I had it in London and then just before Salvador I sold it okay I, I wanted to leave that behind yeah so I was managing the the Bitcoin ATM I was selling peer-to-peer -peer, uh Bitcoin was like, there a lot of like KYC AML headaches or yeah. was that yeah, there was yeah 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 so that was but in spain it's a bit better because the regulation the european union regulation hadn't come in yet or still hasn't it's like mika i think 2024 if you were registered under the bank of spain as a digital asset provider that was enough like the, you know okay and you had the kyc documents the aml documents all written out you're all good um but none of the banks want to work with you. <laughs> they don't like no matter what they just don't so i started working with the bank and it was all rosy but then when volume started increasing to like a hundred over a hundred thousand a month then that was like that was like that wasn't allowed yeah so then i got really into like the peer-to-peer -peer hodl hodl and bisk and robosats and the telegram lightning chat and that was a great way to meet new people in Spain. Like into it as you were like facilitating trades in that. Yeah, okay. and trying to connect people and stuff like that. And that was super interesting. Um, I got to meet some Spanish people that I went to Bitcoin Prague with and stuff. But I felt like there, there was a due date with this because it's dangerous. Like you, you're dealing with you're dealing with dollars or euros and you're trading them with Bitcoin. So if you're in any way involved with with euros, and you don't have a huge amount of capital to to make sure that you're along going along with the regulations you're you're going to get you're going to get squeezed out like you're going to get squeezed out cuz most and i've never used bisc or or how to all is it it's just like peer to peer but how do how, how does the cash part happen so like, they're transfer the... a lot of them are transfers okay a lot of them are just transfers so uh, bitcoin's held in escrow then there's a transfer made from a bank account exactly okay and then once that's made so that opens up a lot of potential problems because it's connected to the banking system exactly yeah 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 and like the because it's from one bank to another bank there's no bitcoin or crypto attached to that but that's what you're doing yeah you know so like you can't that's what you're doing so it was it's a really interesting world and i i think allowing people to access bitcoin across the world is a really important mission but you're also putting your like for my situation i couldn't be involved in that based on my own situation yeah so i decided then to go to el salvador i was listening to your podcast as i'd mentioned off screen and well, I love that. I love the that 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 was uh, what what pushed you. There. It, it was. It was. I was. It was two o'clock in the morning. I remember the exact minute. I like. I was listening to you and Jeremy speak, and and I was like, "Fuck it, let's do it." I get out. I get out the notepad. Had, had you been following what was happening in El Salvador, or yeah, yeah okay. I was obsessed. Really, like you have to give it to Nibukele. He's well able to get 
people riled up oh, yeah. emotionally. So, you know, he was, uh, there was a speech that he had with the soldiers in the fields and, and he was like, you know, saying that it was them, you know, he, he said he had courage, but nothing like the soldiers had courage. And he had one sentence and it was, uh, gracias a Dios, estamos ganando. You know, thanks be to God, we're winning, we're winning. this war. Yeah. And like, you know, that, that like, that was highly emotional. And I, I used that mode of myself to like keep myself going a lot. And I was following the Mi Primer Bitcoin a huge amount. I was following yourself, obviously, in Bitcoin Beach and everything to do with El Salvador. While at the same time, I was involved in, with uh, Bitcoin around Spain and I'd um, I was set to talk in Bitcoin conference in Ireland as well. So my life kept kind of pushing towards Bitcoin. I, I ended up doing a talk in a university. So I was just like, I wanted to focus on this. And I said, I'll, I'll, I'll quit my job and sell what I have, sell the machine and come over here. And, and you'd never been to El Salvador before. Never. So you just quit your job, sold everything. And uh, I was like, let's go. Yeah. Let's now uh, El Salvador, I mean, it is. It is, I think, like the, you know, America was, uh, you know, a couple centuries ago. Like, we see that all the time. People, a lot of times with high levels of education and very motivated and people that are very successful where they're at, but feel like, no, I need to get out of here because the society around me is holding me back and I want to go to a place where freedom is respected and there's more opportunity. So, yeah. I love, I love, I love hearing stories like that. And it's every day I hear like another one. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. To know that other people are coming as well with the same sort of idea is super encouraging as well. And to be surrounded by people like, you know, to get this opportunity to have a conversation with you, Mike, is, uh, is something out of dreams. Like, you know, well, it just feels like a privilege. And let's always tell people it's like being in El Salvador is like a nonstop Bitcoin conference. You're, you're. <laughs> You just, you know, you'll be in a restaurant somewhere and you meet somebody and you're just aligned. And so it it's, and that's the fun part about going to conferences. It's, you know, usually not the actual, you know, speakers. And usually now when I go to a conference, I, I might not even go into a single session. You're just talking to people, meeting people, interesting people. But in El Salvador, that just happens kind of nonstop. Yeah, you're just clicking. You're clicking constantly and you skip you skip a huge amount of conversation that you have had to do. Yeah, you don't have to else. feel each other out and like, uh, can I say this? Can I? Yeah, yeah. You're going straight through it. So, so yeah, that so, was. So you sold everything, bought a ticket, and then uh, I went back to Spain, and then yeah, I just yeah, that's when I had to wrap up everything, quit the job, and I decided, yeah, let's let's do it. And then I I was keeping my ear on the ground. I was talking to a few guys from the Premier Bitcoin, and then I saw what was happening in Berlin, uh, Usulutan, and I could see that it, it felt like there was like the locals were getting involved and they had this tweet out about trees. You can donate to plant trees. And I, just, I got a great buzz out of sending sats for a tree. And that was like, okay, right. I'm going to go to this mountain town because I felt like a lot of people come to the beach and I, I felt like I could try and integrate more into the like, Salvadoreño lifestyle. I didn't want to be among all of this constantly. I wanted to try and like, challenge myself a bit. Yeah. So I, I well, and the fact that you speak fluent Spanish makes it so much easier too. That helps. Yeah, yeah. for sure. So that was it. So I, I came over, I came to- So you started out in Berlin. Well, I, I came to El Zante first and I stayed with James and Kiki. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And that's how I got to know the guys. And that was a great start, you know, really good people and got to know, uh, got to know Paco as well and people from the, from the locality. And I, I really like it. I really like it here. I really do. But I felt like my, my mission was Berlin. So after 10 days, I, I bought a, a, like a little moped and drove from El Zante to Berlin. You bought a what? A moped. Like a, you drove to Berlin from El Zante on yeah, a moped. Yeah, it was my back. back <laughs> so yeah. Uh, madness. It's like that scene from... Uh, a, Maybe you're too young. I don't know. Have you seen Dumb and Dumber? Yeah. Where yeah. they're like traveling together on a little <laughs> moped. Like, that's what I'm picturing right now. No, it's pretty much that. Like, yeah. <laughs> it was uh, my 
bum was pretty sore afterwards. Like. <laughs> so, so you showed up in Berlin on your moped with your backpack. Yeah. Did you have a place to stay? Or? Irma is, yeah, Irma has a hostel which they take Bitcoin and it's like, yeah, it's like a hostel sort of hotel, uh, but it's in nature. And I was like, okay, cool. But it, it's Berlin's like rough and ready, you know, it's kind of quite rural still. So there's definitely some, it's not El Zante. It's not, yeah. it's not the coast. It doesn't have as much, uh, it's not tailored for tourists the way the, the coast is. It's not, it's not like that. Uh, so that was, uh, that was something you that you be, be uh, comfortable being a little more rustic. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Alzante has rustic, but it also has very high end. And so. Yeah, have, it doesn't have yeah. the high end. Yeah. As, as which, which makes sense that, you know, why? But. Um, yeah. So. But it looks beautiful from the pictures that I've seen. Oh, there. it's it's stunning. And it has a huge amount of potential as well. And, and the people that make it up are what make me very, uh, have a very positive affinity towards it. What what's do you know what the elevation is there? I think nine hundred to twelve hundred or something okay. meters. So it's meters. just kind of comfortable all the time. Climate wise, yeah, 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 yeah. So I can wear jeans and shirt, no problem, and be comfortable. And it's coffee country there. Yeah, they export most of it, but it's coffee. Yeah, you're surrounded yeah. by like coffee, cocoa, co cacao, 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 yeah. and. It is, it's quite a self-sustainable little town, city, city, there's 25,000 people, but you, there's a lot of them that are living outside of the city in Cantones and they come in during the day, sell their, their goods, whatever they produce and maybe buy a bit of petrol and gas and then go back to their. So is there, I, I've, I'm ashamed to admit this, but I have not been yet. It's, it's on my list of, of places to go visit, but. Is it like, is there a super selectos there? Is there, so it's smaller than that. There's no, like. There's no, the, I just came from, I was with like, I was with the head of Blink today. She was there and uh, we walked. Nor? Nor, Nor was there. And okay. we had breakfast uh, with the guys. And then we went to the, one of the, the supermarkets and it's the biggest supermarket there, but it's family owned. And. Uh, no, if you want to get super select us, you go to Santiago de Maria, which is about a half an hour drive, okay. a 20 minute drive. So it, it's, a, it's consist, it consists of basically a lot of family owned independent uh, vendors. So it's, it's primed for, for, Definitely. for Bitcoin, you know, in that way. And uh, yeah, well, I, I went there and I met Gerardo and Evelyn, which you'll get to know more from. And you could just sense straight away the authenticity of the place and the, the intentions were good and the intentions were straight. And I was like, yeah, let's let's do it. I already had made the decision that I was going to live in Berlin, but it was good to be met with uh, with honesty and with a hardworking and organized group of people yeah. that were just getting started off. So what what is your understanding of of the the history and how that got started there i've heard you know different versions all all kind of none of them like conflicting but you know people have different viewpoints on on different things so yeah. just curious as to what drew you into that and it i mean it just seems very organic and very i mean what happened in el zante we set out to like do it and it was not that it wasn't organic but it was there there's a plan. there yeah there was a plan there it seems like it just kind of sprung up. Not that there weren't people driving it and working hard and doing things, but but I love like, wow, these are things just sprouting up places. So the history of how it how the circular economy kind of came to be. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think the idea of it itself captures a lot of people's imagination, and that includes the locals. So there's a town called Alegria, which is just beside Berlin, and it's quite popular touristically whereas berlin was like the ugly cousin that didn't get okay. the tourists so this the population the, this this the people who live in berlin who grew up there are really hungry for tourists and they're really hungry for that so they're open they're open whereas the alegria people are not open because they already have their revenue yeah. they already have their profits and uh, and then i wasn't there for the start start but uh 
you know, uh, there was a graduation there, and I think that went down really well. One of the me premier Bitcoin graduations, graduations? happened there, okay. and I think that went down really well. People got to see it, and then I'm probably not in the best place to talk about this because I wasn't present, and you know, yeah, you know, yeah. And, like, but but just your perspective on it, yeah. So so yeah, so like obviously you have two Salvador and your couple, Salvador and your couple who are also. Uh, they know a lot about Bitcoin as well. So you had a brilliant combination and really driven. Uh, and then they decide that to just uh, to just start this basically circular economy and to be able to target not only just the Bitcoin side, but also try and clean up the park a bit, paint the park, uh, take care of the more social uh, issues around the place. And I think thanks to a combination of factors, uh, but from from Gerardo and Evelyn and maybe the initial attention from a premier Bitcoin allowed for the vendors to get motivated. And then once once an idea sort of catches on, then it just sort of like kind of snowballs and and the vendors came out in mass to clean up the the the, the square and the vendors just when you go to a vendor, they're just more open to accepting Bitcoin. It just it's just a thing and you put in the hours of of going to the different places and explaining to them this is how you do it this is how you cash out this is how you transfer it from one person to the other and then it, yeah it was uh and they're have, they're excited about it it's something that that yeah a lot yeah. of the people like you have to take into account that a lot of salvadorinos are skeptical obviously of Bitcoin, yeah. they're skeptical. They put it into the same uh, category as like Nayib Bukele, it's highly politicized. So there's a lot of barriers for that. But the idea of bringing tourists in, that's a huge thing for the locals. So that kind of, that's the main narrative. And obviously you have the Bitcoiners coming in, which are, have a different type of narrative there. You know, they want to have a circular economy so that they can live there using their Bitcoin, but to fortify the town as well, to make it stronger. And uh, th it's about being able to uh, communicate, communicate to the locals the ultimate vision of what Bitcoin is. And well, they're seeing the results. The locals are getting even more and more, more motivated because they're seeing all these tourists coming in that they haven't seen ever. So there has been an influx already yeah. of, of tourists coming in. It, yeah, it's amazing. And, yeah, and living there, yeah. deciding to like live there. So you've got Nikki and James who've come up who have been just unbelievable in terms of the work that they've been putting in and the selflessness, I'd say, on their part. And yeah, yeah I love Nikki and James. They're, they're yeah. so great. Yeah, they're real, like they say yeah. how it is. So and uh, yeah, and then you've got more. So we, we had a Berliner from Germany just join and uh another American as well. So they, they're recent. Uh, so the expat community there is definitely growing. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. And it's surprising for the locals, but it's a city. So there's yeah. loads of young people, there's a square and like you, you get lost in, in the mix of, of the whole thing, you know? So I'm really excited to see how this develops where we've just opened, well, we signed a lease for a center and that's where the education side of things can can develop and we're trying to make it like self-sustainable over the long run with with classes mm -hmm. and selling products and stuff and maybe like subletting out certain parts of the center to people who maybe want to set up a podcast you know we've got interest on that side of things so there's it's a blank slate yeah. and there's a huge amount of potential and there's people who are highly driven who think correctly and you just don't know well, like you said from. they they people people are hungry there too they see this neighboring town that that has this and they want something to set them apart that's i would say that's been a little one of the downsides of of things in el zante is it's been so successful and things have grown so much here that you know you have some people like oh it's not because of bitcoin it's not you know they and it's like eh, it's because you have customers all the time like it's uh you know, sometimes people, and that happens anytime there's something that is successful, there's always going to be, you know, people that 
oh, you know, just bring up the negative aspects that you know come with growth and everything else like that. So, so sometimes for me, it's fun to, to go to a place like that where it's you know they're just like, pudding. hey, they're excited about it. They're um, you know still in the anticipation stage of. So how you do know, you think it would be good to manage that then over the course, like as it becomes more prominent and successful? How how do you uh, how do you bring it back to like okay, this is the root, you know, Bitcoin? How, yeah, because yeah. as as a company gets more successful, they feel less of a need to deal with Bitcoin. Like it's much easier to go to a mid-performing company and tell them about Bitcoin than a high-performing yeah. company. I think you guys will have a, a, you know, Alzante is just so beautiful and picturesque anyways, and and with a surf and everything else. So a lot of what has driven the growth has just been, I mean, there's been, you know, a million different documentaries or, you know, newspaper articles or magazine things that was spread with all these pictures. And so it's it's kind of naturally drawn in a lot of growth in, in tourism. I think Berlin's going to be a little bit different. Not that it doesn't isn't beautiful and doesn't have lots of to offer, but it's. I think it might be a little bit different. Like it, and it's a bigger town. Alzante is a very small village, so when it's when things grow like that, it has you know maybe a more disproportionate impact than a than a city of twenty five thousand. And so, mm, I would, yeah, I I would, I wouldn't be concerned about that. I would just keep. The, the stores and the businesses that want to accept it and want to be part of it, they'll they'll generate the the FOMO from the other, you know. And that's what we saw here in the early days. It was, you know, wait, that business has all these people there. Why are they there? Oh, because they're accepting Bitcoin. We better accept Bitcoin. And so it's um, it's competition. Yeah. Thing. So it's 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 good when when people are in that those early stages. That's a fun that's a fun time to be in a place. So there's lots of anticipation and excitement and you feel like yeah. you're at the start yeah. of something yeah, that's yeah. about to explode. Yeah, you know, and sometimes when people like have made it and things are better, they you know, all of us we get like used complacent. to it and yeah, complacent or we take things for granted. And so uh, that's why always you know, people hear like, Oh, well, it's always been good here. It's like ten years ago, like the unemployment was rampant. Like <laughs> it was but people remember, you know, they always have selective memory on things. Yeah. So and tend to focus on like the negatives yeah. maybe as well. Yeah. That, that's super interesting. It's just human nature. So so you can't let those things like derail you, but it's but it is fun to be in a place that's more in the I like I'm I'm it's like the honeymoon uh, yeah. stage or something. I'm an entrepreneur. I like doing new things. I hate managing things. So I like the like early stages where you're thinking of like crazy things you could do to bring attention to something or, you know, all that stuff. When it's later stage, when it's just more about management, it's, the, yeah. yeah. So, so I'm, it's I'm, I'm a little bit course. jealous that, that you're uh, living in a place that's in those still uh, early can, stages. It takes two hours and a half to get. No, to no, the we're, I'm going to be there for sure. And it's, we have a place in Punta Mango on the other end of the country and that's right on the way. So oh, it's, it's on my list. Um, but, but yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll for a, sure come lot, and visit. a lot on your plate, yeah. Mike. No, but I want to see. Plus, I love the climate there. I mean, I, I love El Zante. I love the beach, but you just sweat all the time here. So I, I've started to become more of a fan of the coffee country here. And yeah, it's nice having the yeah, you know, having not to put the energy into cooling yourself down. Um, yeah, and it's not, but it doesn't get like crazy cold where you need a heater. It's like this kind of good mix that there's a good balance yeah. there. Yeah. So I'm assuming nobody really has air conditioning or heating, right? It's, it's no, yeah. no, 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 no. It's just uh, plain houses. Yeah. Nothing, nothing crazy there. Uh, you might need a, a little bit of a blanket at night when you go to Perfect. sleep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I miss being able to throw on a, even like a hoodie sweatshirt or something. It's, yeah. yeah. So yeah. So that's 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 really. That's so, great. So did you find a house to live in? Or are you still in the, the in hostel? The hostel. I was there for a full month. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. I was there for a full, full month. And that was, uh, that was that was good, but I felt like I needed more independence. So the renting situation, you have to look. It's because the houses aren't as well prepared maybe as other places. So you need to search for what you want. But something popped up, which was unfurnished. And it was a three bedroom. And I was like, all right, let's. Let's go for this, try and sublet out the, the rooms. And yeah, so I have this this house after a month, then I moved into this this nice three bedroom house 
where it's I'm among I'm among the locals. I'm in just just beside the town, but I feel like I'm living a, a Salvadoreño lifestyle. Like you're not you're not living a touristy yeah. lifestyle at all. It's like yeah, you're just there playing soccer with the lads every you know second day down at the at the pitch. And that I'm assuming rent and homes are much cheaper there than they would be in El Zante or I the coastal areas. Assume so. Two hundred quid for a three bedroom house is what I'm paying. So what would that be in dollars? What's two hundred dollars? Two okay. Two hundred. You said two hundred quid. Yeah. Like, what what is quid? I don't, I, I don't even know. Yeah. I usually say quid. <laughs> so uh, so two hundred dollars. Yeah. For the whole for the three bedroom house. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. You couldn't get a room in El Zante for, for that. that. So. Yeah. So. Uh, now other people are paying more for what they have and it was unfurnished and stuff like that. But yeah, I assume it's much, much cheaper to get a place there. And there's yeah, what other food is obviously much cheaper. You know, you can you can eat, you can have your pupusa dinner for a couple of couple of dollars. Yeah. And yeah, it's just that it's early beginning stages at the moment. And um so are the locals like, why are foreigners moving in here? Is yeah, it kind yeah. of bizarre to them? Yeah. But very welcoming, I'm I'm assuming. That's one thing Salvadorans about always Salvador, are. Salvador, yeah. yeah. It's like, they're so happy to have you yeah. there, but also at the same time, really confused as to why you've decided <laughs> to live there. When it's like ingrained in them that they need to get to the States from yeah. the get-go. It's like, that's that's our mission. You know, we need to get up there. That, that seems to be a so when they start seeing people starting to come to their own town, they start to like check themselves a bit and be like, what, like, okay, what, what's so attractive about my town? And then it's like, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, this town is good. And you start to see yeah, like a that change, pride. yeah, yeah. Uh, which is great, it's great. It's like an appreciation for their own place that they're getting. But they're asking a lot of questions. They're trying to figure out what are your intentions? What interests do you have of being here? Um, there is the local tourism board, and then there's the the group Berlineses in Action. It's called, which is like the the Bitcoin Berlin group. Okay. Because uh, and yeah, they're they're trying to figure it out, but they see that there's work being done in the town, like the painting, the cleaning. They see the vendors learning about Bitcoin, being able to have, you know, accept Bitcoin, and and there's now they're seeing the Bitcoin Center come up, so. Yeah, I feel like it can integrate well into the town. Uh, but you, I'd say you, Nikki and James have been amazing in terms of coming, not having too much Spanish, but being able to just. Yeah, they have the personalities that, that people just love them. So, yeah. Uh, so it, there's not that many uh, expats there yet, but it's growing like very steadily. And I feel like. For people who want to come and try and live there, it wouldn't be impossible yeah. either. You know, be- well, I'm, there's it really has so much to offer on a practical level because you have, you know, kind of a it's a big enough city that you can like get stuff, and it just sounds like you don't need to have a car. Um, the the weather's great there; it's a lot cheaper to live there, and it's it's picturesque. And so there's definitely like just on a practical level whether or not there was bitcoin things happening there it sounds it makes like there's sense. a lot to offer if you make the decision come to come to el salvador to live you kind of scan what's yeah. available around you and it seems like a a place that you'd come and check out but when you hear that there's like over 50 vendors uh from all to providing all sorts of goods and services except in bitcoin like i pay my rent in bitcoin i rent my cars i pay in bitcoin really I, yeah, I cut my hair, Bitcoin. Uh, my groceries are all in Bitcoin. Uh, I buy my cooking gas, Bitcoin. It's like, it's 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 everything. I my bills, obviously. So you can f- live on a f- complete Bitcoin standard there without any issues whatsoever. You've got all sorts of types of restaurants from pupusas all the way to like you know, fine fine dining uh, that accept Bitcoin. So you can come over there and. Yeah. Just chill and be around people who are down to earth as well. You know, I think the the mountains makes people down to earth, yeah, like yeah, real. Yeah. You know, like you, you can get into good <laughs> conversations. There's no um, there's no dramas. There's no dramas. 
So yeah, I highly recommend anyone who's around El Salvador to come check it out anyways, just see what's up. So when you were staying at the hostel, like who else did you see come through there? Like the hostel itself? Yeah. So it wasn't that busy when I was there in terms of people. But was it like, were Salvadorans, would they stay there or were backpackers, you know, from Europe or what was the... The main... Like, I, it surprised me that there was a hostel there. Like, what was what's their, what was their target market? Like, what's the... <laughs> so, such good questions. Um, the United States, Salvadorino who come back from the United States, they might go and stay there. Okay. That's, that's a huge, huge influx of capital at the moment in Berlin. It's... Salvador. Everywhere in the country that... that Salvadorans are living in the U.S. There's a lot of them that have done really well are like bringing their wealth back to El Salvador and yeah. investing here. You can see that as well in land prices around Berlin. You can see that like in terms of houses and stuff like that. Prices are real, really coming yeah. up. And you have guys coming back and like reconnecting with their roots, the Sal Salvadoreños who have gone over to the States. And it's kind of really nice to see. It's it's amazing to be in a country where people are going from such suffering to like the lack of suffering and seeing how that how that transpires. Yeah. So yeah, so th those are the type of people. Uh, obviously, a couple of Bitcoiners came through and we're staying at the hostel. It's more of like a rustic uh, ho hostel motel. Yeah. And yeah, but I kind of had my own key, so I was kind of independent when, when that was happening. And then, yeah, so you spend a lot of the days out uh, talking to vendors. You spend a lot of the day uh, hanging out with the others from the group and being able to discuss like next next steps, next moves. You, uh, yeah, you're you're playing football with the lads, going to the gym. You're just living your your daily life or my daily life in in Berlin. Now, like you, you put in also, I've got friends coming over from other countries coming over. So you've, you're dealing with that. I've decided that, you know, I bought a drone and I said there needs to be more land available for sale. So offering people to be able to get their videos done uh, for, for their land and to be able to place that up on a, on a website and Facebook marketplace. Cause I feel like liquidity is low. Yeah. You need to go to a town. You need to figure out how, how to find land. You need to know this person, this person. Yeah. yeah. So, and I, I know there's definitely a lot of capital on the sidelines looking to come into El Salvador. So it's just about making that available for, for that capital to come in and like making it attractive packaging in it in some way. So that's, that's what I'm, I'm focused on obviously the project, but being able to, you know, put a few deals through there on that side. So are you, how much time are you spending working on the, the project? Is it? Oh, it's nearly full time okay. job. Uh, yeah, cause there's re like meetings, like there's a center that's happening. There's a, there's just a lot of stuff to do. There's a lot of vendors who are trying to figure out how to work things. There's a lot of people who are interested in Berlin who are coming to Berlin. So it's a lot of meeting people for breakfasts and lunches and stuff. It's kind of, the superficial stuff but like it's it's done you, ha you have to do yeah. it so that's a lot of it it's a it's introducing i'm also running the the page the twitter page as well so it's about like editing the videos and making sure that you know they're attractive and getting exposure is there ways for because this is the one of the areas i feel like we've done a poor job in here is we had this huge influx of people that wanted to come, wanted to be involved, want to help, but we we did a poor job of figuring out how to like fully utilize that. We just have, you only have so much bandwidth and you don't know what people's skills are. And you know, sometimes when you're working with kids, you, you really want to vet people before you like connect, you know, adults with any, you know, people are gonna have interaction with kids. And so- You're more uh, standoffish at the start to be able to, yeah. Yeah, so it's been, it's been a, it's, it, that's been a been a challenge, but I don't know if the, and people ask me all the time, and I feel bad. I'm like, I don't know. Come here, and you'll you'll find Figure a way to, to to fit out, you know, to, to fit in and what your skills add. Um, but do you think that there's? I mean, would you encourage people to to show up to Berlin yeah. and, and figure out where they can plug in and a hundred percent. Okay, and that's that's a thing that surprised me. People have just found their kind of role to play or whatever 
in in that group you know you have people coming from from germany berlin he just comes up rocks up and he's just been like going at it at a hundred percent getting the word out you know and trying to come up with ideas that are practical and it makes a difference like it definitely makes a difference on in the town in some shape or form so there's a lot of people who do come and start to work towards something definitely feel a sense of purpose that's what i've noticed and they tend to want to stay and keep going with this project because there is that feeling there is that feeling that it's at the start of something and even even though there's been so much progress i feel like there's a lot more yeah runway. yeah it's still very very early stages there yeah and like you wonder how that influences other towns around the country if try and figure out how how is salvador going to develop the networks in between the different towns and once the infrastructure starts to even develop further how you know what happens to like prices of food and stuff like that i'm really interested to see the dynamic of el salvador compared to all the other nations in the world and see like what happens with inflation? What happens with the the, the government debt? Well, th this is something that yeah. I'm, that I'm like constantly kind of wrestling with, uh, and and then your part to play in this small town. Do you know were were there German immigrants that were involved with founding Berlin, or what is the name connected to Germany, or what's the story there? Yeah, I'm probably not the best historian to talk about this, but. It was f founded in the late 1800s by a German family. Uh, and uh, then a lot of Turks arrived. So a lot of Turkish, a lot of Germans. And it was a huge coffee place and actually quite wealthy town. It had two cinemas. Uh, oh, wow. Colonial buildings, uh, incredible church. And it was producing a lot of coffee, making a lot of, creating a lot of wealth. It was German, German, German originate, originators, but then the civil war happened and that the town suffered a huge amount during the civil war. Are, is there still a lot of people in the town with, with German and Turk ancestry or a did lot of those left. people left? A lot, okay. of, a lot of them left. Yeah, I'm sure there is. And I'm sure out in the cantones, there's a few people who have like the, the blue eyes and, yeah. and the blonde hair. Um, but a lot of them did leave during the civil, civil war was mad. Like I was talking to a pupusa lady and we were talking about the, she was talking about the war when she was like 12 and she said, yeah, no, it was pretty rough. She, this is in Spanish. She's saying pretty rough. Like sometimes we go down, uh, went down to the, to the square and one of my friends calls me over to the place and then she pulls something up and it's like, uh, just a head that's been beheaded. And they were like playing around with like, you know, severed body parts uh, back in the 80s. It, it was it was pretty heavy there. So a lot of people left and a lot of the buildings were burnt down and the cinemas were burnt down and everything. So then it was then rebuilt. But the really interesting part of Berlin is that the the gangs never actually arrived there. They were really never influenced Berlin or Alegria. It didn't even touch it. So it was always peaceful throughout that time period. Was there a lot? I mean, I, I know there are some places that were kind of like that. Punta Mongo was one place kind of like that. But there was definitely like a tight knit. Some might, you know, refer to them as like vigilante type group. But there was like a group there that made sure that people if you look like you're a gang member or they had heard anything, they basically Expelled. gave you till sunset to leave. Um, was it one of those situations where they kind of like banded together to keep them out? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody knew each other from in the town. They knew who was coming into the town, yeah. who was leaving. And uh, I think the fact, this is pure conjecture now, but I think the fact that they were, a lot of the guerrillas were there. Uh, they had this kind of, uh, this culture of defending yeah. that sort of area and it's at a height as well so you have to that's an advantage it's harder to it's harder to take over something that's on a hill that's this is conjecture it just it was it was tranquilo during that period of time and i feel like that then uh you can see that reflected in certain people's demeanor that they haven't gone through that like feeling of fear maybe but this is also something that i've just come yeah up. no that's that's very interesting I, I mean, most of the country was 
was inundated and that's so close to Sulitan and Sulitan was one of the worst places as far as gang control really so yeah yeah i remember so, going down and feeling still there was a heavy oh, air yeah when we because we drive down there to get the end of the country and it's yeah it's like so uh, what was that like then from transitioning like from that period of not being able to go to anywhere to now like it it's something that's hard to conceptualize for anyone else yeah, yeah i think it's less dramatic for me or other foreigners than it is for the Salvadorans. There was this weird, almost like you were off limits if you were a foreigner. You know, a lot of a lot of places you go, they'll target foreigners, they'll kidnap you, they'll, you know, you're more of a target. But in El Salvador, because the gang's primary like income was extortion and American, you know, Americans, any foreigner, but specifically Americans, were kind of seen as troublesome. Like they're more likely to fight back. Really? They're, they're more likely to report, you know, if somebody tries to extort you. But I think even more importantly, there was if something did happen to a foreigner, the repercussions were much more severe. You know, the military would come in. It, it just, unfortunately, it just for them was caused more of a scene. So the government was more likely to, to respond and to, you know, just to keep the, the other partner countries happy, like, Hey, we're responding to this. So it was this weird. And I think specifically Americans, you're just kind of used to you, you, you know, something's not right. You fight against it. You have, and I had to fight that in myself because when, when they would, we only had one time that we were approached and said we had to pay. And I was like, no, we're not. We're not doing that. And they. What was the response? I just said we're we're, we're living here. We're working in the community. We we don't have a business, and we're we're just not going to pay. And they're like, okay, that kind of just went away. But wow. even talking to other Salvadorans, for them, it was just part of life. Like it was it was kind of like almost living in the me medieval times. Like you you paid to whoever kind of controlled your area, and so they saw it. It was a different monopoly of violence. They had yeah, the monopoly yeah. over the violence. And the state didn't have the monopoly of violence. The the you know the the gangs did, and so they saw this as like, well, we can pay a you know a thousand dollars a month to hire a security company, or we can pay the gangs two hundred dollars a month, and they'll take care of things. And so it was, I think, for them normalized. For me, it was like a, I had I had to like realized that I'm a guest here and it's it's not my place to speak into these things. But to me, it felt like morally wrong to, to pay where to them, it was like, no, that's just what you do to like survive. Like Stay it's alive. just part yeah. of life. You don't and, even have the option as a Salvadoreño. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's how they felt. I mean, that would tell me like, you can get on a plane and leave. Like, <laughs> you know, we can't. So I think that was, was something that was like, yeah, that's, that's true. Like, so because of that foreigners i never really felt restricted in where i could go i mean you know you would obviously try not to be in a bad area of town at night um and there were certain things that you didn't do but i know for even a lot of my friends like i'd say hey we're gonna go there and like oh, i can't go there because that's 18th street territory and you're like you're not in the gang they're like no it doesn't matter like this area is a mess so you can't go there because it's it, it was this weird thing and a lot of it was happening beneath the surface without with me being a little oblivious to it and so i think sometimes what as they say uh, ignorance is bliss so you know i would go places and tell salvadorans and they'd be like wow. so well okay interesting so so yeah so yeah, it, was different a, it was a little bit different yeah and and even a lot of the stuff that i knew about the gang activity came from my my kids because they, they had be. friends that and so they knew all those things but people you never talked about it there was uh um you know that was one of the like gang slogans was like oh was oh like, yeah he listened to it but i can't even remember what it is no, but something no, like no, don't, no, yeah, yeah don't don't say anything don't yeah so it was like you would even like as we try to talk to people they would just be like and change the subject so it was very underlying so wow but then you notice when things got better then people were more 
open about it. Like they wouldn't even tell you, like if you asked them, like, do you have to pay protection money? And they would like, nobody would tell you it was, but after things started getting better, then it was like, yeah, no, we have, now we're not paying after 15 years. And this is the first time that, you know, that's ever happened. And so, and these were even like the, the driver I used from the airport. I mean, they're in the airport, part of a organized, the, the collective that does all the airport transportation and they're being they, they all paid. Like that was just a normal. And he said, this is the first time in 15 years that wow. we're not paying. So it really has transformed just people's outlooks. Um, one thing that really confused me when I first came to El Salvador was there was this huge lack of signage for businesses and the businesses would be in these like weird places that were hard to get to. And you're like, how would you even know that there was a, you know, in America, like it's like big billboards there and they may do everything you can to like get you in here. It was like the business was in a gated community that you had to like talk through the guard first to get in. And then there was like no sign. And that was because you didn't want the gangs to know that you had a business, like you wanted to remain hidden. So it was just like cat and mouse game of them trying to let their customers know that, that they, they existed, exist. but making sure they didn't draw the gang's attention in this. And so I think that's one of the things you've seen that's kind of dropped. And so businesses are figuring out how to market for the first time and to be more open with with everything they do um the nightlife it used to be like at night you didn't you didn't go out i mean even in, in alzante things got really bad i think it was 16 and 17 things got really bad and you would not see anybody at night and it and even a few years prior to that there would be people walking at night and so but now you know people will walk to friends houses at night it's it's kind of totally transformed and so it's yeah, you just see this kind of weight lifted off people's shoulders. Uh, I, I think that this is going to lead to growth that people can't even imagine because it's going from a suppressed mindset to one that's much more open, like free to do. And they can get creative as well. Everyone can get creative here. You know, it feels really good to be able to plan ahead. I felt like that wasn't something that, I had I could experience in Europe like I felt like everything was going on on another trajectory so coming over here to El Salvador it feels like okay like there's a bit of certainty about the next couple of years um at least so you can start planning and you know you you feel like you're protected with your savings as well and it's you know it's just a it's a, it's a weight off the shoulders as well and it, you feel kind of like you're in this uh, this shielded zone of el salvador um which is which is quite interesting so it's i've i've heard that same thing in like 10 different ways from you know 100 different people like just how they felt not like oppressed in the sense that you know they were like going to go to jail or that, but just like stifled they were you know in europe or in the us or in canada and they just felt like so hemmed in by everything and you know they had businesses but it it becomes such a pain to try to operate and they just sense that that is like lifted from them they, they have this excitement again about what they can do in life and so it's it's kind of really like yeah it's just changed their whole demeanor like demeanor. they're different people it's like you you nearly have to abide by certain social standards even in your other country as well you, you've you've built up a type of lifestyle and yeah. like you're trying to uphold that like you've got your your social circle or what whatever and and you you might not even be happy in in that social circle but like you're trying to keep up those standards coming over here is like okay how do you want to invent yourself as a person what do you want to focus on um you still have to work. You have to figure out ways to to be able to to make it work. But it's just kind of like a feels very free market, like yeah. feels very free market. Like Spe speaking of work, because that's the question we get from people. Like, how can we support ourselves? What's going to be the what are you working remotely or what's the what have you found with that? Yeah. So I uh, because I was selling sell, I sold a good few assets or not even that much, but I had a bit of a cushion coming over here and that was coming in in like lots. 
So I was able to have a bit of time to figure things out. Uh, but I'm I'm actually I'm actually doing a few maths and stats classes to a Salvadoreño uh, American, and you know that's a, that's an income stream. Um, obviously the Jerome, in in Berlin or remotely? Remotely. Okay. Remotely, and he's in like Son, Sonsonate or something. Like okay. That. Uh, so that's great. That's that's brilliant. I'm getting to learn about stats again. Again, <laughs> uh, then I have the drone as well. So I've gotten a bit of a, a stream from that. Uh, I'm also subletting a room as well. So I'm figuring different ways of making an income that like is above my expenses. Yeah. You know, so what I think is that there's a lot of capital coming in. You understand who's holding that capital. You figure out what their problems are and then you just figure out what skills you already have to try and leverage those to to make a bit of money and to be able to keep yourself afloat and keep keeping your expenses low like don't try and uphold the lifestyle that you might have been used to beforehand i think yeah. that's that's the main main thing the i think there's two like a uh, because of there's this influx of foreigners but also salvadorans from the us who now have us tastes for things they want people that understand how they want things built or designed or, and so i think there is a lot of times people think like, oh, well, how how could I be competitive in that market? Actually, you have an advantage because you have this skill. A lot of times you can partner with a local where they have the workforce or the machinery and everything. And you bring in the expertise of like, hey, this is what these people want. And they're willing to pay double if you do it like this versus the way you're doing it. Yeah. And understanding the pain points. Isn't that part of like... In, integral to to setting up a business, understanding your own pains and what you've experienced in your in your country and and applying it here. So so yeah. So also there's a a hostel that wants to be built. Uh, so as I mentioned, there's a friend who's come over from from um, from Ireland. He's been traveling around, but he's come here to live and he's looking for land. So. Uh, my plan is to also help out a little bit there and have a bit of equity in in the hostel in in it. Berlin. Uh, not he's looking all around El Salvador, okay. looking around all El Salvador. But my focus at the moment is seeing how Berlin develops, uh, making sure you know my income stream is above my expenses, and yeah, and like uh, un like understanding Bitcoin is like a, a real purpose thing for me, and understanding Austrian economics. You know, I've I spend a lot of time reading and trying to understand these things and explaining it through through whatever channels I have, uh, trying to break it down, trying to break down economic concepts because, because we're going through, this is my view on things, is we're going through an, a time where you're incentivized to, to, to take out debt up to your, up to your teeth uh, by real cash, uh, real assets that provide a cash flow and pay back your debt on time. That's like the, that's the, the, the play playbook yeah. to f succeed financially. And we're going from that time where it's actually, you know, you're disincentivized to take out debt because it's a inc like the Bitcoin's constantly increasing. Uh, you're incentivized to save. Uh, you're incentivized to hold more like cash because that cash is accruing over time Bitcoin. And you're incentivized to consume less and only to only invest into things that directly affect your business or your your lifestyle. So we're going through a, a comp like complete 180 in terms of how to manage yourself financially as an individual and a business. So my my purpose is to be able to understand how that transition is going to happen for 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 individuals, how it's going to happen for the town, uh, for the different companies, and what's the best way to allow for people to change their mindset from one to the other to allow for a more harmonious transition yeah because we're going through this it's going to be a like painful transition for a lot of the world but the more people are aware of how the semantics work how how the the idea of bitcoin and it as money works well for you as as an individual and how to spread that knowledge how to understand that knowledge how to structure it and how to spread it I think there's going to be Bitcoin universities. I think there's going to be different branches of of of, of practices within Bitcoin, and I, I really want to push that. I really want to see that develop. I think El Salvador is poised to be able to 
hold that. Like we've had Kubo Plus students come up to Berlin and hold classes for the for the vendors. I love that. That's just been unreal. Like the the wealth of knowledge, the deepness of it, and and being able to to be part of that is just is just amazing. But I think there's room for universities to to happen for seminars to to happen on Bitcoin on on Austrian economics. And I want to get I want to get deep into that. I've always been academic, so I, I want to try and leverage that a little bit. And actually, and is that, I, I think we had the logo for what was it bit by bit? Is that the natural investor? When, so is that tied into that, or is this a different? That's tied different into venture? that. Okay. That's tied into that. That's tied into that. So when I was in India, I was uh, reflecting a lot, let's say, and I came up with the concept of the natural investor and the i the idea of finance and money is has always been kind of linked with evil and unnatural um you know especially in the last 50 years so i was trying to understand is money evil like is it wrong to focus like with med with meditation and buddhism you know there's different areas of focus and i was wondering is building wealth a worthwhile pursuit as an individual and I started to f like try and read deep into the texts on like the old Hindu texts on, on wealth. And I found out that it was encouraged for you to build up wealth because it allowed for you to to have a base by which you can experience peace. So you have a base of of uh, resources. So Buddha said, like, hunger is the worst type of disease. You know, you need to have a base of wealth. So I was trying to figure out how can we how can one link the concept of money and the concept of spirituality or the concept of 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 being at peace with yourself yeah and i f i feel like so it's an integrated part of you it's not like your financial life and and then your yeah, yeah ex it's like the the combination of of the financial world and the natural world and i felt like you know the financial world in general is quite distorted like the incentives are are there for you to cheat and for you to not like help out all of all of life like it, it it prevents you from it prevents from the whole world being at peace let's just say the the way the financial world is structured at the moment and i feel like having a bitcoin world incentivizes for people to to be at peace with themselves and to to let go and to to find what brings out their soul let's just say so i'm trying to figure out like how to invest your money in line with your own nature as as a human being so like everyone has their own path in life everyone has their own wants you know you can believe in a soul or not but you have a purpose on this planet to do something and uh, bitcoin is an amazing tool that that can allow you to 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 realize that so that's what i'm trying to really delve into i'm trying to link these two things and i feel so fortunate to have found Bitcoin and to realize how hugely impactful it is for the for the whole world and you know and to understand what suffering is and the lack of suffering and to be able to 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 bring that tool and to amplify that across the world in whatever way by focusing on locally and then pushing out so the natural investor that's 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 the aim long term I like that no, you see a, a lot of people will say like, well, I'm not really into finance or I don't want my life to be about pursuing money. And like, you need to understand your, your life right now is really dictated by finances, whether you like that or not, that's just the reality. And when the financial system is corrupted, it leads to a life that's corrupted. And so for them to understand that it's not about pursuing money for money's sake, it's like we want a fairer money that incentivizes people to behave properly rather than one that incentivizes people to behave badly. And that that it's, it's really not even a financial thing. Like it really is shapes how lives are lived and how people get to spend their time. And exactly, I mean, you see that Clearly here, just by the number of Salvadoran dads that don't get to see their kids because they're in the U.S. for 20 years while their kids are growing up because they couldn't make a living here. And so they had to leave. And so 
for for me it's it's a very like important issue because you just see like if we can fix some of these things it fixes families that you know and it's i want to be realistic that bitcoin's just a tool it's not the end all be all but it is a crucial tool to have in those things and to make the system actually work for the people for the people yeah it's you know they don't want to think about uh, money uh, people want to focus on their family or their yeah. job but if you don't focus on Bitcoin, you'll have to be thinking about money for the rest of your life because it's going to be the one pain point. You know, you're going to be suffering from not, not having enough, yeah. you know. So it's better to get involved early and figure out how to use it properly so that you don't have to be thinking about money. No, 100%. So you can spend more yeah, yeah, time. Yeah. No, 100%. Because, I mean, we've seen here just how much of the, I mean, even the gang issue was... A big part of it was because of financial issues. Like you had all these parents leaving, going to the U.S. And so their kids were growing up without real structure or people there. And so they were attracted to the gangs, which then made the economy worse, which forced more people to leave. And so it was a money problem. Yeah. And so when you fix that, you you naturally fix these other things. Now, that's not saying that you don't need other aspects and you don't need security and don't need some of these other things, but you, if you don't fix the money, it's ultimately going to fall back into disarray. It's like this uh, so. coordination tool of allowing for all our actions to be aligned with each other as humans. So everyone does their own thing. They look out for their own interests. And then uh, we use different tools to be able to work together, divide our labor and be able to, to complete the mission as, as a group, yeah. as humans. And Without the current structure, which allows certain people to steal that labor. And, and then the, cause, yeah. and cause poverty. And high in in uh, it's, it's obfuscated as well. You can't see this, the the robbing that's happening, and they don't even realize it, which is even worse because it's everyone's suffering, and I don't even yeah. know why they're suffering. So this tool that allows for us to coordinate in a way that's like like in line with what everyone wants to do is just uh, like the further you think about it, the more beautiful it can. The flower that can come from this is 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 pretty beautiful, but it's a uh, it's uh, there's a lot of work. Yeah, <laughs> there's yeah. a we're, lot of work to do. And we're in, in early early stages. So, yeah. well, we could talk for hours, but uh, I want to make sure we let people know how they can follow you, um, how they can support these projects. Anything else you want to shill and make sure people know about? Um, yeah, well, Austrian economics get involved. Like, I just think it's fucking brilliant. It's a great theory that backs up Bitcoin. Uh, the natural investor, I'm the natural inve one, natural, the natural inve one on Twitter and then on Instagram. I'm just at the natural investor. Uh, come up to Berlin, check it out. It's pretty, pretty cool. You can live on Bitcoin there, and there's a like a lot happening at the moment. So Charlie said you all can stay at his house. Uh, <laughs> we have a massive yeah. party. I, I'm actually a DJ. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, yeah, just a natural investor. Can, can uh, people DM you if they if they're looking yeah. for you know any just, questions okay. whatsoever? Any questions? I'm I'm always there, and uh, and yeah, just keep it real. That's it. Perfect. That's a good note to end on. Yeah.